And if you're having a hair transplant, probably the last thing you want is somebody to notice that you've had a hair transplant. And so I've said on the air, you know, when CNN came to my clinic, I told them back in, I think it was in 2001, I said, look, hair transplantation is 90% art. Yes, you have to have the right tools. You have to have the right technology. You have to have the right personnel. But if you don't have an aesthetic eye, an artistic eye, what you're going to end up with is something that looks bizarre. And for someone who's trying to make themselves look better, a permanently bizarre hairline is sometimes, uh, you know, what we call walking wounded. And unfortunately, many times patients come back from these distant locations or even local locations where things are not done so aesthetically pleasing and they're unfixable or very difficult to fix. And uh, it's unfortunate that uh, people have spent a lot of time, money. Uh, they've spent, uh, you know, time in, in third world countries getting procedures and treatments and haven't gotten to their goals. So just a buyer beware out there. Uh, you know, there's a reason why uh, we are listed as one of the top 20 clinics in the world. Hello and welcome to Get Yourself Optimized. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer. It's my pleasure to have Dr. Alan Bauman with us. Dr. Bauman is a full-time board-certified hair restoration physician who's treated over 33,000 patients, has performed over 12,000 hair transplant procedures, and over 10,000 PRPs. Since starting his medical hair loss practice, Bauman Medical, in 1997. You may have seen him on NBC Today, on CBS Early Show, ABC Good Morning America, CNN, The Doctors, uh, Bulletproof Radio, Men's Health, GQ, et cetera, et cetera. He's been voted number one top hair restoration surgeon in North America by Aesthetic Everything and top hair restoration surgeon of the decade and received the 2022 Lifetime Achievement Award in hair restoration. It's also recognized by Forbes as one of the 10 CEO of Transforming Healthcare in America. Dr. Bauman, it's so great to have you on the show. Stefan, great to be with you. So let, let's talk about uh, what the heck is biohacking baldness? Like, wh wh why do you need to biohack it? <laughs> well, you know, of course, uh, those of us who are biohackers, we like to change our environment, change our nutritional intake, change our lifestyle so that we can hopefully live longer, right? Increase our lifespan, increase our health span, which is, you know, not just the number of years in our life, but the amount of life in our years, but also to increase our hair span. So uh, that's what we're aiming to do. Uh, increase the amount of time that we get to spend with a thick, full, healthy, luscious head of hair. And so when it comes to biohacking, you know, we can use like these external molecules. We can use a holistic approach. We can use pharmaceuticals. There's, you know, kind of no rules when you're a biohacker. And um, I think biohacking baldness came about mainly through my discussions and work with Dave Asprey, the father of biohacking, who asked me to give him a head of hair that would last him 180 years. Right. And uh, I believe he did some uh, live streaming while you were working on him, didn't he? Well, 100 percent. Dave, well, first of all, he did uh, everything under the sun in terms of uh, keeping his existing hair. We leveraged all of his state of the art treatments uh, as well as hair transplant procedures to restore his hairline to a more youthful position to fill in the big bald spot in the back of his crown that most people didn't even know he had uh, because you know, he's like 10 feet tall. No, maybe about six something. Um, and, uh, and to utilize all manners and methods of healing to get him optimized prior to the procedure and uh, to get him healed, obviously, after the procedure and growing quickly. So uh, working with Dave has been uh, very, very exciting for us in the world of, uh, of hair restoration. And uh, we had a chance uh, to meet originally at the American Academy of Anti-Aging back in around 2016 or so. I was hooked on Bulletproof Coffee, and uh, we had a discussion about hair and things like that. So, yeah, it's been great uh, to see Dave. We also did the transepidermal delivery system on him, which is the use of growth factors and peptides. So you know, he'll throw everything but the kitchen sink at it, so to speak, because he wants to, you know, keep a good, thick, full, healthy head of hair, as most of my patients do. Right. So what would be some of the uh, most unusual and some of the most impactful procedures that Dave did? And by the way, he was a guest on this podcast uh, years ago, talking about a lot of biohacking procedures and, and techniques that uh, he had come across and, and also incorporated into his lifestyle. So yeah, what were some of the most impactful and the most unusual? 
Yeah, I, I would say probably some of the most impactful things, uh, the use of red light therapy. He does use the turbo laser cap. Uh, the Bauman turbo laser is a device that he says has more lasers in it than anything he's ever seen. Um, and that's a non-chemical hair growth device. That's a, uh, uh, a, uh, a device that we can prescribe and dispense to patients. It's FDA cleared for hair growth. And it has a huge amount of coverage across the scalp. It's a portable, it's uh, powerful it's cordless, rechargeable. It packs completely flat for travel. And I think it's, it, it forms kind of the cornerstone of biohacking baldness because, again, it's, it's a treatment that you can do on your own. It's one of the least costly treatments over time because it's essentially a one-time cost. And it has absolutely zero side effects. You know, no one's ever had any issues with uh, low-level laser light or photobiomodulation or red light therapy. Uh, you cannot overdo it, nor can you overdo it with the turbo laser. And in just five minutes a day, you know you're going to get better hair growth. But certainly there's other things, you know, that can go along with red light therapy aside from the turbo laser. You know, some of the things that he did in conjunction with his procedure were the use of cell therapy. Um, you know, obviously we're transplanting the hair follicles, but we want those follicles to take and grow very, very well. We want his existing hair to grow very, very well. And so we utilized blood platelets as a source of, source of growth factors. We used PDO, which is polydioxinone. Those are po polydioxinone threads, which were placed into the scalp to stimulate hair growth. And we can also use exosome therapy today. That's a state-of-the-art cell therapy that comes from a bottle, essentially. You know, these are uh, exosomes that are created in laboratories today uh, under the guidance of some very, very, very uh, smart PhDs and so forth who uh, curate these stem cells and uh, put them under a specific environment so that they will release these exosomes, which contain growth factors and cytokines and microRNA and all of these things that are great for healing and for hair growth. And uh, we have those literally in the cryo fridge. You know, we defrost those and can apply them directly to the scalp. So those are some of the things that Dave did, uh, you know, during his procedure, in addition to having a state of the art follicular unit extraction hair transplant, which is essentially taking hair follicles from the back of the scalp and implanting them to the thinning or the balding areas. Mm -hmm. And is that done with a robot arm uh, or do you do that by hand? So, ro well, robotic hair transplants is, uh, has been very, very exciting part of the practice. Uh, just to talk about that for a moment, it was FDA approved back in 2011. The first artist robot uh, came available. We certainly uh, got ours pretty soon after that. And we used it for many, many cases for many, many years. But before the robot was available, we used mechanized devices. So the mechanized devices were handheld uh, rotational devices, essentially ergonomic, so that you could extract the hair follicles. Uh, by hand. And then robot was certainly helpful, but not a miracle. There was still a need for doing manual devices. And then what happened, I would say over the in recent years, is that these manual tools got so sophisticated that they kind of outpaced the robot in terms of uh, ability and accuracy, uh, size of the instruments and so forth. So um, while I do love robotic hair transplants, you know, the robot is the single most sophisticated semi-autonomous surgical instrument on the planet. Uh, to be honest, we don't use it as much these days. In fact, we haven't used it in a couple of years. So we focus now primarily on uh, manual extraction using these much tinier instruments that produce a little bit less trauma in the scalp. I find that in, our, in our hands, you know, in my clinic, that's what we find works the best. Uh, I'm not afraid of the robot. We certainly have used it and had great results with it. But today we use a variety of different types of tools, depending on the, uh, the patient uh, characteristics, you know, different hair color, quality, texture, whether we want to take the hair with the long hair attached and not shave any zones. That was the thing about the robot is that we had to shave a huge area in order to get the harvest done. So it was not really appropriate for female patients, certainly not appropriate for men that wanted to wear long hair and not have that downtime associated with it. So using uh, the more sophisticated manual tools that where we can rotate the instrument differently, you know, either back and forth or an oscillation or vibration uh, settings, that enables us to take the follicles without trimming any additional hair. And so that's kind of a unique thing that we're able to offer to patients that most clinics in the world cannot. Hmm. So how much downtime are we talking about? So you come in for a hair transplant procedure. How long do you kind of hide under a baseball cap? <laughs> yeah. Now, are you talking about for a normal person or for somebody like Dave? Because <laughs> it's different, right? Yeah. No, well, let's start with a normal person, like our our listener uh, who might. 
Yeah, Stefan. So the normal healing time is about six to eight days. And so most patients will be here with us in Boca Raton uh, near the clinic and visiting us after the procedure for about a half hour each day. And during that time, we're applying uh, different types of ointments and sprays. We're doing a sophisticated scalp wash. It might be a, a mechanical scalp wash tool, actually, that we use for that. And we're making sure that the healing is on point. Their patients are going to get red light therapy. They're going to get a, bun- a variety of therapies while they're here in the office. They might undergo hyperbaric oxygen and other types of treatments uh, to expedite their healing. Now, once the sixth day rolls around, usually those crusts and scabs that you would see in the transplant zone, those are starting to exfoliate. They're, they're lifting off from the scalp and they're washing down the drain, essentially. Now, the follicles healed and underneath the skin, so there's no harm in once the, uh, the area is exfoliating to really scrub and wash that area. In fact, we encourage that. So that's pretty typical, six to eight days. Um, Dave, with his healing regimen, and he's written books about that as well as uh, produced his own movie on on recovery from surgery, I think, uh, used a variety of different tools, including ozone therapy and and, uh, supplementation and a few other things to expedite the healing. So he healed in about half the time as a normal person would. And uh, normally we would see hair growth visibly starting, you know, somewhere between four to six months. And for him, it was really two to three months when the hairs were starting to grow. So he had some really accelerated healing. Um, You know, obviously being optimized makes a big difference uh, in terms of that recovery time and uh, also in terms of the hair growth. So it really doesn't take that much time. I guess your you know, short answer to your question is that basically if you don't want anybody to know that you've had this done, you're going to be under a baseball hat for about a week. Okay. Yeah. I remember uh, when I had a procedure done in 2009, they, they, took a strip of skin from the back of my head uh, about an inch wide from ear to ear practically. And uh, of course I was awake for the whole procedure and that was pretty awful. <laughs> and it was super painful to uh, um, go, th- go through that uh, healing process because it's so tight back there and I couldn't really uh, bend or I, I, I couldn't, move my head down and not experience a lot of pain because it was so tight. And, and, um, yeah, that was just back in the old days. Uh, so I know they, Stefan, that that's old style procedures. Now, you know, when I was in training over 25 years ago, the linear or, um, strip excision was really the mainstay of therapy. That's what everybody was taught. That's what everybody did. Um, but even as early as 1999, I started to think about how can we get these follicles out without taking a big strip of skin. And my background in endoscopic surgery and general surgery in New York led me to believe that a minimally invasive approach would certainly be more preferable. We knew that minimally invasive surgeries for uh, the GI tract and you know, for orthopedic surgery, even brain surgery, neurosurgery, obviously resulted in less downtime, less pain, quicker recovery, and less complications. And so We didn't really have all the tools for follicular unit extraction as we have today. Here we are, you know, more than two decades later. But I always thought about that in those early days, that there's got to be a better way to take the follicles out. And, uh, you know, I I feel very blessed that I was amongst, uh, you know, a handful of surgeons out there in the world who were pioneering this technology in that timeline, you know, in the 1999 to maybe 2004 uh, when I first designed our original instruments to help us manually extract those follicles from the scalp. So today, it, it's a huge difference between what you had with a strip and stitches and staples, you know, maybe weeks of downtime out of the, uh, you know, out of a physical regimen, you know, out of an athletic regimen, you know, staying out of the gym to avoid it stretching out. And uh, that's a common problem that we see with those old style procedures. Today, with FUE, follicular unit extraction, the downtime is minimal. As I mentioned, uh, you know, the crusting is exfoliating in six days, but you could be back in the gym in as quickly as three or four days. Sweating and running is no problem. Um, You know, the donor zone essentially is almost indestructible. Uh, You know, don't try that with stitches or staples in your head. And of course, the biggest benefit is that there's absolutely no linear scar left behind. So... Uh, There's a lot less discomfort. Most patients take like, you know, two Tylenol to go to bed the first night. I mean, it'd be kind of unusual to need more than that. Some patients do, but it'd be very unusual after a day 
uh, following the procedure to need any kind of pain medication whatsoever with FUE, follicular unit extraction. Uh, whereas with the linear harvest, as you described, uh, it's so much longer and, and more uh, uncomfortable downtime. Yeah. yeah. And I, I know that there's a, a big kind of medical tourism uh, center in Turkey for hair transplants. Why Turkey and why is it so much cheaper over there? Mm -hmm. Well, look, medical tourism for cosmetic surgery is not something new. I mean, uh, you're in Miami, you know that there are unlicensed dentists performing uh, tooth extractions in their garages in downtown Miami. Uh, you know, you don't have to go far to find an unskilled professional. And the same is true whether you live in South Florida or anywhere around the world. Uh, where the labor is cheap and there's no governmental oversight, there's no licensing board or safety regulations, you're going to have a plethora of you know, non-medical professionals basically taking advantage of the situation and taking advantage of uh, the desperate people who are out there. So it's pretty sad. Uh, you know, we see in, in the world of cosmetic surgery, my, look, my mentor was a very prominent plastic surgeon in Manhattan. And uh, he took care of patients in an exceptional way. And he had patients that fl flew in to see him from around the world. But everybody knows, you know, even from here in South Florida, you could fly to Costa Rica and get a liposuction at half the cost. But the problem is that the complication rate is not, uh, you know, half or twice as much. It's maybe 10 or 20 times as much as what you would normally see in a certified facility here in the States. So I guess I would just caution patients uh, to, you know, for the buyer beware. And there's plenty of warnings out there from the, the conferences and clinics. And uh, I should say, um, you know, the, the third party regulatory bodies about destination surgeries that are at a, you know, at a cheap price. So, you know, a good hair transplant is not cheap and a cheap hair transplant is not good. And yeah, it might be executed okay. But what I see coming back from some of these places, and it's not just the countries that you mentioned, but other places around the world where the work is not sophisticated, is that people are coming back with a straight across hair cookie cutter hairline. And if you're having a hair transplant, probably the last thing you want is somebody to notice that you've had a hair transplant. And so I've said on the air, you know, when CNN came to my clinic, I told them back in, I think it was in 2001, I said, look, hair transplantation is 90% art. Yes, you have to have the right tools. You have to have the right technology. You have to have the right personnel. But if you don't have an aesthetic eye, an artistic eye, what you're going to end up with is something that looks bizarre. And for someone who's trying to make themselves look better, a permanently bizarre hairline is sometimes, uh, you know, what we call walking wounded. And unfortunately, many times patients come back from these distant locations or even local locations where things are not done so aesthetically pleasing and they're unfixable or very difficult to fix. And uh, it's unfortunate that uh, people have spent a lot of time, money. Uh, they've spent uh, you know, time in, in third world countries getting procedures and treatments and haven't gotten to their goals. So just a buyer beware out there. Uh, you know, There's a reason why uh, we are listed as one of the top 20 clinics in the world. There are plenty of surgeons around the world uh, who operate at this level. And, uh, but you know, uh, it does require training, expertise, instrumentation, uh, good quality professionals. People have been with me for over 20 years. My, my team has been with, taken over 20 years to, to coalesce, uh, you know, into a, a symphony of detail to make sure that every patient is taken care of in the best way possible. And so, uh, yeah, I would, I would just caution. I just put a word of caution out there to do your homework, do your due diligence. Uh, and if someone's offering you a discount or a coupon or, you know, oh my gosh, you can jump into the chair next week. You know, I would just be careful of that. There's a reason why they're giving you that offer, uh, you know, or offering to pay for your travel. I mean, that's the other thing, you know, if somebody's buying your ticket to Turkey, you know, included with the procedure, uh, unfortunately, you know, the government is in on it. And so, uh, you know, God forbid you had a complication out there, uh, you might never see the light of day. And so I'm going to just kind of leave it there and let the buyer beware. Gotcha. And, and what sort of price uh, is typical for a, a procedure? And I know it's, based on the number of hair follicles. So maybe you can kind of explain how that works. 
Sure. Well, I mean, obviously, we don't discuss pricing until you've had a consultation. But the bottom line is, is that the price of the procedure is dependent not just on the numbers of hairs. I mean, it's like, you know, you're not buying like a gallon of gas here. Um, you know, there's a lot that goes into the procedure preoperatively to get you ready for the procedure, to make sure that you're an appropriate candidate for the process, to optimize your lifestyle, your hormones, your medical conditions, uh, you know, what medications are you on that could be interfering with your hair loss situation? What diagnosis do you have? You know, uh, and many times uh, we have to rectify those things before we go get started with any kind of procedure or treatment. And then don't forget there's medical therapies or other non-invasive treatments that go along with the procedure to help you protect the non-transplanted hair. So, you know, Costs can be significant, but remember that hair transplantation is a permanent solution to hair loss. And if the follicle's dead and gone, uh, no manner or method of uh, mystical creams or lotions and potions are going to bring your hair back. Uh, even the best biohacks, if you will, are not going to work on a dead follicle. So you better have the right diagnosis before you proceed. And so if someone that's listening is interested in figuring out how much is a hair restoration process going to cost? Well, they need a detailed diagnosis, and that would start with a virtual consultation, and that's easily scheduled through the website, baumannmedical.com. They can request one from anywhere in the world, uh, from their home or phone. We can get on a video call, Zoom, Skype, or otherwise. Uh, or if you're local to South Florida or can fly in to Boca Raton, uh, we can do an in-person consultation. We can get the AI-powered microscope on your scalp to measure your hair quality and density in every area. So we know exactly how much donor density and quality you have available. And then we make a plan. And so the plan is going to be all inclusive. It's not just, oh, this is the price per graft. I mean, no, that's that's a crazy way to think about a hair transplant. It's an all inclusive process uh, that we are you know, in lockstep with you really forever because this is a chronic and progressive condition. So for the long haul, you're with me and uh, we don't like to lose hair. Um, you know, we will make sure that you keep the existing hair growing strong. And if necessary, transplantation, if it's required, we'll do it. And all the other things that we mentioned today, medications, laser light therapy, nutritional supplementation, regenerative medicine, you know, are all parts of the practice. And so, you know, even patients who are not candidates for hair transplants, we can help with cranial prosthetics, you know, medical hair systems, if you will that are appropriate for people with chemotherapy alopecias, temporary alopecias, um, patients who have had scarring alopecia or hair loss from, from wounds like military explosions or, uh, or, or, or house fires and things like kitchen fires. We've treated a huge number of those patients pro bono uh, in the practice. So it's very, very difficult to say. Oh, and also the location. So if you're thinking about an eyebrow transplant versus an eyelash transplant versus a scalp hair transplant, you know, those are all different. Maybe you need mustache or beard or sideburn, or maybe you're covering a scar from a uh, a plastic surgery procedure, or you're, you know, you've had a brain tumor removed. I've seen a lot of those lately. Um, you know, you've had a benign brain tuber, it's been excised and now you're left with a big old scar. We can fix that. If you've had a facelift or a brow lift, we put hairs there too. Even for those patients like yourself who had an old linear scar in the back from an old style transplants, there's a lot of things that we can do. So the range of cost of transplantation is huge. Uh, and I would just encourage anyone interested in learning what they particularly need is to get an evaluation that's detailed and not just an off the cuff number. And uh, you can do those evaluations over video. Well, absolutely. Our video consultations have been super popular way before the pandemic. Obviously, with the Zoom and Boom phenomenon, uh, that number increased dramatically as people were locked down in their home with their phone and wanted to get an idea of what it would take to get their hair completely restored. So uh, we've seen a huge increase in patients inquiring about hair transplantation since the video conferencing really became more and more popular with every, how many users you now are getting on Zoom or Skype or Google meetings or whatever. They're looking at themselves, you know, on video, maybe more than they would in the mirror, spending hours a day looking at their hairline going, oh my gosh, I don't want to look like the oldest guy in the Google meeting. <laughs> I want to look like uh, I have a youthful appearance and uh, a youthful frame of mind. And that delivers confidence. You know, when you are confident about your hair, uh, you look good and feel good. Just and, and that's why people like Dave Asprey and biohackers, you know, they want to not just feel good on the inside, but they also want to exude that health and vitality on the outside. And it's 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 hardwired naturally as humans. We want that. Yeah. 
Yeah. So w when you look at somebody's hair density, you you can tell using a, a video session like on Zoom uh, what density they are they have and the amount of miniaturization of follicles they're experiencing and all that. Well, right now we don't have the technology to measure density accurately from a distance. Uh, we do have machines, uh, portable microscopes that we often bring to uh, consumer expos and things like that. Uh, obviously, we have them here in the office where we can actually do a density measurement on the spot. Uh, we do a photo and that gets sent to the cloud and then re a reply comes back with the exact numbers. All the follicles are highlighted and, and characterized and so forth. Uh, there are larger devices that we have in the practice called hair metrics, which is an artificially intelligent powered microscope. Uh, we have the hair cam, hair cam pro. Uh, those are smaller devices that many of our hair coaches use. Like let's say they're in a salon or a medi spa, or they're in a, um, a, a medical practitioner's office who doesn't specialize in hair restoration. It's a smaller portable device. We teach and train how to use those to measure hair density. But on a video call, what we're really talking about is the coverage, right? So hopefully you've sent in some photos ahead of time. If we're talking to you virtually, we can see with your hair wet and parted, a general idea of the density and the quality of the hair. We can often see, even if the hair is not wet and parted, where there's a diminishment of hair quality because the hair will lay flat, let's say, in the crown for many of our male patients uh, when, the, when the quality of the hair starts to diminish. But obviously, in male pattern hair loss, you can see a receding hairline, and we can talk a lot about that, how much transplantation is needed. And we can get you started on the medical therapies. So we may not have such an accurate density measurement doing it virtually, but we can at least start the process. And then when you come in, I uh, had a patient today fly in from Arizona for his uh, follow-up, and we did measurements for him. We did his hair check uh, measurements as well as the AI-powered microscope measurements, great improvements on the medical therapies. And he was glad that he came in for those measurements, even though it took some time, effort, and energy for him to be here. Many of our patients will visit from afar uh, at least twice a year, if not more. Gotcha. And, and what do you uh, recommend typically to patients in terms of preventative or uh, maintenance type uh, procedures or not procedures, but modalities? Is it red light therapy for most and Propecia for most folks, or is that more rare to recommend those sorts of yeah, well, as we said previously, it all starts first with the detailed diagnosis. So the medical history is going to elucidate what's the cause of the hair loss. So what are the compounding factors or risk factors that are contributing to the man or woman's hair situation? And once we've identified those, we definitely want to minimize risks. Now, you mentioned Propecia, which is an antiandrogen therapy called finasteride. Uh, Propecia is off patent. So everybody's using just finasteride, either generically or typically with a compounded version of finasteride. And the reason why finasteride is important for men is because it's probably the most powerful treatment that we have. Uh, it works 90% of the time to keep you looking good for the long term. That means nine out of 10 guys get a positive response from just taking a pill once a day. That's pretty good. 2% of patients might have sexual side effects from the drug. That's not so good. Uh, we can avoid those sexual side effects by stopping the medication, which comes out of your system in about a week. And then we can transfer that medication into a compounded topical version of finasteride. So we do prescribe a lot of finasteride and have for two decades or more uh, because it's so powerful. It's not the right treatment for everybody. So if you're disinclined to use an antiandrogen treatment, at least orally or systemically, and uh, maybe you're thinking about it topically, obviously we can start there. But other medications could include minoxidil, which as most people realize is the ingredient in Rogaine, even though Rogaine is not so great. It's kind of greasy, gooey, and irritating to the skin. Uh, but a compounded minoxidil usually is a little bit better tolerated and it has better efficacy. We can also use minoxidil orally today, which is kind of nice. Keeps it simple and easy, not so messy. It's not going to mess up your hair. Very powerful microdose oral minoxidil is uh, a very common therapy. But a lot of our biohackers, I would say, want to stick with something that's more natural, maybe non-pharmaceutical. And so red light therapy becomes a mainstay of therapy. We can use nutraceuticals. So those are nutritionals like salt palmetto, uh, curcumin turmeric, uh, which decreases inflammation. Salt palmetto affects the androgens, of course, um, and other nutrients like proteins uh, and therapies such as PRP, platelet-rich plasma, and other regenerative treatments like peptides and growth factors to really stimulate hair growth without using uh, pharmaceuticals.
So those are some of the basics, you know. But um, I'm curious to hear what you're taking personally. Are you, are you taking finasteride or minoxidil orally? Are you taking peptides, uh, growth factors? Yeah, mo most people may be watching or listening. They don't know, what, well, why would Dr. Bauman need something for his hair? It looks pretty good. Well, my dad was totally bald. And uh, before we transplanted him, obviously, we did transplant what looks like a full head of hair back for him. And my mom's dad had a big bald spot in the back and receding hairline. So I've always been nervous, even before I went to my surgical residency and training, that I was going to lose my hair. My dad's dad, my grandfather, uh, I'd never met the guy with hair. I thought he was born bald. You know, no, I'm just teasing. But, I, you know, I always thought, hey, look, this is coming for me. So I've always thought about, hey, when is this hair loss situation going to affect me? And certainly I've seen it and I've measured it. So I've been in quite a stack over 20 years. I've used a variety of treatments, including oral finasteride, topical finasteride, and minoxidil. Oral minoxidil today is one of my therapies I use consistently. I've designed, redesigned and re-engineered the turbo laser cap, which is the proprietary laser device that we use. Uh, that sits on my bedstand, and I use that nightly, five minutes a night. Uh, I have not used... Uh, any regenerative treatments yet, although I'm signed up to partake in a microneedling uh, clinical trial because I've never used microneedling in the past. Um, but I've also designed my own nutritional supplement line specifically for hair. And I've come across over the years specific supplements that can be helpful for hair regrowth. And that's what you would find in the Bauman Wellness System for Hair. And that might include collagen peptides, uh, biotin, uh, multivitamins specifically for hair, and uh, probiotics specifically for hair, things like that. Uh, also things that might reduce stress, like the, we call that the Zen Master, which is an ashwagandha-based product, as well as a couple of different hair care products. Uh, I have a very, very sensitive scalp. And so I first thing I designed was a hair care product called Soothe, which is a conditioner and also a shampoo that uh, decreases inflammation at the level of the scalp using a CBD component. And probably even more importantly, I use a shampoo and a conditioner pairing called Boost, which contains an olfactory derived compound, which is a, uh, a trigger for the actual chemo sensors in our scalp embedded in our hair follicle that can trigger hair growth based on odors or smells, chemicals that you would normally be able to smell with your nose actually can now be triggering hair growth on the scalp. And so that's a sandalor compound that's in the Boost shampoo. So the Bauman MD line contains uh, the nutritionals, the hair care products. It also contains the laser cap and other devices like that. Uh, we also have microneedling tools and things such as that for home use. And then, of course, the things that we do in the office, like uh, in-office laser therapy, uh, the TED, which is transepidermal delivery of growth factors and peptides, a really exciting technology that's uh, a lot less uncomfortable than a traditional PRP, even though our, our PRP is not painful at all. It does require a blood draw and some injections in the scalp. The TED treatment is growth factors and peptides applied with an ultrasound delivery device. So have you done PRP for, uh, on yourself or somebody, uh, another practitioner uh, did it on you? Uh, so no, I have not had PRP yet, um, but uh, it's something that uh, I'm looking forward to. I know PRP works great and uh, I will certainly use it in my stack. I would not hesitate to use it. Um, probably today I would maybe start with the TED treatments first because uh, I've seen such a great result with that in the practice over the past year or so uh, since we got one of the first devices here in North America. So what does TED stand for and what does PRP stand for? Oh, well, gosh, PRP is platelet-rich plasma. It's a, a concentrated version of platelets that's derived right from your blood. We eliminate most of the red blood cells and we leverage the platelets and concentrate them to a dose of 10 to, tw 10 to 12 billion platelets per treatment. We found that that's the most effective dose uh, and the concentration of 1.5 million platelets per microliter to give us the biggest boost of hair growth. So that's PRP platelet-rich plasma. TED is a new technology called transepidermal delivery that uses ultrasonic waves to break up the skin layer called the stratum corneum, which is the moisture barrier, and to actually push these larger peptides and proteins, uh, as well as the growth factors, right through the skin without a needle. So that's a really nice treatment. Both of those take about an hour in the practice. Some people will do mostly PRP. Some people will do mostly TED. Some people do both, combination. Um, PRP, once it's one treatment per year is typically enough for most patients. The TED treatments require a series of four treatments once a month for four months to see the real improvements. And PRP and, and probably TED too, I would guess, uh, can be helpful to uh, rejuvenate and, and bring uh, 
kind of youthfulness to your, let's say, skin on your face. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the vampire facelift was really what the Kardashians brought to the forefront, right, back uh, well over 10 years ago now. And that was kind of the the explosion of PRP and all the medi spas and things like that because it was a non-chemical rejuvenation. I think it was while uh, Kim Kardashian was pregnant, she had that treatment done on her face, uh, leveraging, again, the growth factors in, uh, that are within the blood within the blood platelets, I should say. And uh, that's kind of the, the, you know, the birthplace, if you will, of popularity of PRP that you would see for skin. Uh, can you use the TED, transepidermal delivery, on the skin of the face? Yes, of course. And uh, my esthetician has taken a number of classes for that. Uh, we do have an aesthetics program in the practice, in addition to our functional medicine program. Uh, the aesthetics program is designed for skin rejuvenation, uh, we do laser hair removal. We do skin tightening. We have the Morpheus, a uh, few other different devices and tools. Uh, and that dovetails very, very nicely with obviously the hair regrowth treatments that we've been offering for over 25 years. Because, you know, once you've, once you get the fat, the head of hair looking great, you know, well, then you start focusing on the forehead and the cheeks and the chin and all of that business. And so we need to have some good rejuvenation for that as well. And so that's been extremely popular in the practice. And Blanca, my uh, esthetician, has really been super busy uh, dealing with our male and female patients, of course, uh, on the aesthetic side. And so micro needling that refers to using really tiny needles to deliver the PRP uh, in, in, into the skin. Well, our PRP is actually injected directly into the level of the follicle. So the microneedling is something that we can do, uh, is something we do uh, actually apply right after the injections of the PRP. I think it's important to understand that, you know, some people apply PRP topically and then just do microneedling above that. That is going to have a very weak effect typically. You really need to inject the PRP at the appropriate uh, depth in order to get the stimulation of the hair follicle. That's what we believe has worked best in our hands. Um, I think it's kind of important, you know, because people say, oh, I got PRP down the block. It didn't work. Well, you know, how many platelets did they use? Oh, well, I don't know. They didn't measure it. Where did they inject it? Well, I don't know. Are they a scalp specialist? No, they're just a skin specialist. Did you even have injections? No, we just had microneedling. So, you know, it's like saying, well, I made pizza, but I didn't put the cheese on it. You know, it's like, it doesn't make any sense. Got it. Okay. That's interesting. So, so where does, um, uh, let's say CBD come into play here? How does that help with, um, uh, hair loss, hair, uh, regrowth and maintenance? Yeah. So cannabidiol is a very, very interesting compound, obviously that's a non-psychoactive component of the cannabis plant. Um, we use CBD in a lot of different ways in the practice, and there's been some interesting research in the published peer-reviewed clinical literature to show that CBD at certain doses can stimulate hair growth. Certain dosages have been used to fight acne and improve skin health. CBD can also decrease inflammation. So there's a lot of good reasons why CBD um, you know, and the receptors for CBD, these cannabidiol receptors in the skin, especially maybe even the hair follicle, uh, could be leveraged uh, for our benefit. And so for many, many years, we've used the CBD-containing squalane moisturizing ointment. And that's a healing ointment that for, for patients to use after their procedures, or right on the scalp, in the donor and the recipient zones, to not just moisturize the crusts and the scabs for comfort and for exfoliation purposes, but to minimize the inflammation that occurs thereafter. And so that's been a very, very nice popular treatment. A lot of people keep that bottle and they use it as a styler uh, afterwards, you know, because it moisturizes the hair. It's a squalane based product, which is really nice. Squalane is a compound that's, uh, you know, packageable, obviously, but it's similar to sebum in terms of its consistency. So it, it plays very nicely on the scalp. It's non comedogenic. It's not going to create inflammation. It's, in fact, it's going to do the opposite. It's going to decrease inflammation because of the CBD component. Now, the CBD component in the Soothe uh, hair care line has a very specific role is as an anti-inflammatory. So I think we're going to see more and more information about how CBD affects the skin and uh, affects the hair follicle as more of this research comes out. Yeah. It seems like uh, CBD is getting uh, kind of a bad rap, maybe by the uh, medical, uh, industrial complex or by governmental bodies, but it actually can be quite helpful. 
Oh, we've seen great results with our CBD containing uh, products and treatments. So uh, I would just say, you know, if the uh, if the government or the, uh, you know, the, the regulatory bodies are skeptical of something or starting to poo poo it, um, you know, I, I'm not telling people what to think, but, you know, maybe you want to just take a second look at it. Uh, because so far the government and the uh, and our insurance companies and uh, big pharma hasn't necessarily done much to improve our health these days. Yeah, it's uh, more disease maintenance than uh, <laughs> uh, than healthcare. So- yeah, and look, as as soon as something that's cheap and easy and readily available that has no side effects comes out, uh, you can bet there's going to be a backlash uh, from you know the powers that be because they want to keep everything you know patentable pharmaceutical. Uh, and regulated. So, you know, especially say, I mean, you've seen this in the world of cell therapy. Um, You know, there've been actions by the government to try to shut down the use of using your own cells for healing. And uh, it's just unbelievable that that has taken place in this, in this world. Uh, You know, leveraging our own body's regenerative capacity is the third epoch, if you will. It's the next phase of medicine. And so you're, you're, we're in the midst of a transition right now away from pharmaceutical interventions. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's an, exci- it's an exciting time to be alive for sure. Yeah. hundred uh, percent. Let's talk a bit about exosomes. So what are they? Uh, what kind of uses would, uh, you want to incorporate, uh, uh, exosomes in, in, into kinds of uh, healing or or therapies and are these harvested ethically uh, morally or uh, h- tell us more about exosomes so well let's just start with the basics so exosomes are just little bubbles that come off of cells and every almost every cell in your body can give off exosomes and every bodily fluid contains exosomes from breast milk to saliva you name it and so exosomes are everywhere but what do exosomes contain? Well, what we learned from cell therapy, like stem cell therapy, or using mesenchymal stem cells or mesenchymal signaling, medicinal signaling cells, is that they did not like when you when you put mesenchymal uh, signaling cell, mesenchymal stem cells or MSCs into a joint, let's say that's injured. Years and years ago, when I did my uh, stem cell fellowship training, we thought that maybe those stem cells were becoming the injured joint and repairing the cartilage in that way. And it really wasn't the case because after a while, you'd go back to that joint and you couldn't find those cells. So the question was, in patients, let's say, who had fat transfer from abdom- abdominal fat during a liposuction into their face for, or hand for rejuvenation, why did the skin tone improve? What was, what's going on there? And those are the first things that I saw in the world of cosmetic surgery. And uh, being really interested in plastic surgery, well, what was going on with these adipose transfers, and why were this? Why was the skin tone improving in the face and the hands when you do the adipose? Well, some smart researchers figured out that within the adipose tissue, and many other mesenchymal stem cell uh, containing tissues in the body, for example, like bone marrow and uh, even hair follicles and things like that, uh, that the stem cells themselves just sensed the local area and release these growth factors and peptides and microRNA for rejuvenation into the zone. So if you had an injured knee or a joint, the cells would sense that injury and do what it was required to initiate repair and rejuvenation. And so how did they do that? What did they secrete and how did they secrete it? Well, these chemical messages that the cells gave off were contained in exosomes. So exosomes are like little bubbles. Think about them as like one one thousandth the size of a cell. So if you were looking at the size of a, uh, an old-fashioned Cadillac, and then you compared that to the size of a Hot Wheels car, right, it's about a thousand-fold difference. So that's the difference between the size of a cell and the size of an exosome, right? One one-thousandth the size of a cell. And so cells give off these exosomes under certain environments. So let's just say you had a paper cut, and you had uh, cut through some blood vessels there. And the skin all of a sudden is not getting enough oxygen. Well, the cells in that local area sense that low oxygen, and then they start to secrete different growth factors through exosomes to trigger new tissue regeneration repair, but also new blood vessel formation. So theoretically, if you could have, uh, let's call them stem cells in the laboratory that in a bioreactor and you're creating, you know, millions and millions of stem cells and you put them under this low oxygen environment, all of a sudden they start to release these very, very powerful peptides and growth factors and microRNA that would normally in the body tell the body to rejuvenate, repair, and maybe grow new blood vessels. Well, 
in these labs, these FDA cleared laboratories, you can, uh, these researchers are now collecting the exosomes, purifying them, concentrating them dramatically, sterilizing them and freezing them, putting them in a bottle and then sending them out to physicians for use. Now, today we can use exosomes topically. And this is because some uh, guidelines have been handed down by the FDA saying that they would prefer us using uh, exosomes in a topical way. And what you've seen out there, what I've seen in many of these um, uh, uh, presentations and, and, uh, and conferences in the world of cell therapy and cosmetic procedures and treatments, is that exosomes have dramatically enhanced the healing times of cosmetic surgery patients. They've healed wounds in half the time. In uh, you know patients who were expected to need skin grafting or some kind of invasive surgery to repair their either diabetic ulcers or, or or blast injuries from fireworks and things like that, topical exosome therapy has healed these wounds almost miraculously. And these reports continue to appear in the clinical literature at the conferences that I attend. And so we're very we're very excited. I mean, look, that's how I got started with PRP. I wanted a great wound healing treatment for our hair transplant patients. And so we've been using exosomes in the practice for many years, and there have been a variety of manufacturers, a variety of different uh, concentrations. And uh, I won't go there, you know, beyond the scope of our conversation today, but we've narrowed down uh, those companies and distributors and manufacturers and FDA approved tissue banks that really make the best exosome products. And that's what we use on our patients topically. And it's for me, it's been amazing to see because it's truly leveraging the power of the stem cell without having to worry about dealing with the cells. I don't have to take an adipose extraction on you to get those powerful cellular messages anymore. I basically get them in a bottle and they're consistent. I know how many are in there and uh, it's very, very exciting. Now, how do we get those into the skin during a procedure? Well, we can use it topically, as I said. We can use it along with microneedling. We can use it along with TED. The transepidermal delivery is a very cool way to do it. And so we'll be at the Dave Asprey's biohacking conference in the next couple of weeks uh, here in Orlando, and we'll be applying the TED, which is the growth factors and peptides, but also exosome therapy directly through the skin uh, without a needle. And so I'm super excited about being able to demonstrate that latest and greatest technology. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing that. I'll be at the conference. <laughs> oh, cool. Well, schedule your treatment ahead of time. For those of you who are listening out there, uh, you know, if you'd like a full-blown TED treatment, like more than a demo, uh, we do have some uh, limited slots available. And of course, you can do it with the exosomes if you like. Awesome. And then uh, I know we're running short on time here, but I would love for our listener to understand the difference. Is like There's different kinds of oxygen therapies. So you mentioned earlier hyperbaric oxygen. You also mentioned ozone therapy. Like, What's the difference? And uh, what are some other oxygen therapies that uh, are, are discussed in the biohacking community? Yeah. So, I mean, these are very different, obviously. So ozone therapy can apply, be applied topically to the scalp or even can be injected into an injured joint, things like that. And it creates a hormetic response, meaning that the, there's a certain amount of stress that's put on the cells in that area. And then the body responds kind of like a trigger, kind of a boost. And so I'm not saying that all patients should do rectal ozone like Dave Asprey did, uh, although that was uh, one of his uh, healing hacks postoperatively. Um, but that did seem to help and accelerate his healing process. And we're learning more and more every day about ozone therapy, whether it be topical uh, you know, or injected and so forth. Uh, we can also use ozone therapy in conjunction with PRP. So we mix our ozone with our PRP and inject that. I'm sure you maybe have heard about extracorporeal blood oxygenation treatments where they run the blood through uh, an ozonator and then back into the body. And that's a pretty exciting new technology. And we've heard a lot about that. I don't perform that in the practice, but there are local clinics that do that here in South Florida. And that seems to be a very, very powerful healing and, and uh, anti-aging therapy as well for tissue regeneration and repair for sure. So that's very, very different than hyperbaric oxygen. Hyperbaric oxygen, you may see these big chambers. They come in kind of a soft and hard variety. The, uh, the higher the pressure inside the chamber, the more oxygen that gets dissolved in the bloodstream, essentially. And so instead of dissolving oxygen just in the iron part of the red blood cells, if you put yourself under a uh, significant amount of pressure, uh, you know, atmospheric pressure, 
you can then dissolve the oxygen in the liquid part of the blood, which is kind of cool. Uh, and that delivers that oxygen to the wound healing areas, to an injury, uh, to patients who have had uh, traumatic brain injury. Hyperbaric oxygen works great. We often use that for military veterans, a gray team that's here in Boca, uh, which I, you know, I'm the medical director of. Uh, for many of our patients over the years, we've used hyperbaric oxygen to stimulate wound healing after hair transplantation. It's not as popular today because our healing is, is pretty quick, as we've discussed previously. But, you know, years ago when the patients were dealing with stitches and staples, hyperbaric oxygen decreased pain, decreased inflammation, accelerated their healing times, increased the wound uh, structure and tension that was created by the body. And... Uh, we got uh, an acceleration in hair growth from that as well. So I would just caution patients, you know, remember there's that, as I said, the soft chamber doesn't go as high in terms of the pressure. So you need re more repeated treatments. A harder chamber is going to give you a higher atmospheric pressure, you know, maybe two atmospheres of pressure. And so that will give you a higher delivery of oxygen. You need fewer treatments that way. Gotcha. But I'm a huge fan of hyperbaric and ozone therapy. And then there's hyperoxygenation and hypooxygenation. We, a long time ago, I had uh, uh, one of the guys from Live O2 on the show to talk about um, their device. And uh, yeah, that, that was interesting. Do you, are you into any of that? Yeah. I mean, look, if, I'm a skier, but I, you know, it's hard for me to train uh, when I'm here at sea level and be ready for, uh, you know, my uh, high altitude uh, ski adventures. Obviously, you know that there are uh, teams and, and different sport, uh, different, different sports athletes that will train at higher elevation where there's lower oxygen to stimulate more red blood cells to appear in their blood, to carry more oxygen so that they can be more efficient. So, uh, is there something to it, to the, to training it at hypooxygenated states? I think that there probably is, uh, I haven't tried it yet. Although, uh, you know, I look forward to trying that, uh, before my next ski trip. <laughs> Awesome. And one thing you mentioned earlier was PDO. And for our listener who's not familiar with, with that, could you explain that a bit further? Oh, yeah. So uh, one of the innovations that we've made to our PRP and regenerative treatments is the use of scaffolding. And so in regenerative medicine, there's kind of this triad, if you will, or trifecta of, of cells, signals, and scaffolds. So Let's say you go to a regenerative medicine conference, just about everything you're going to see on the stage and in the expo area and you're going to be talking about with your colleagues is going to fall into those three categories, cells, signals, and scaffolds. And we've actually talked a lot about that today. I was one of the first physicians to use a biologic scaffold in conjunction with our PRP. Uh, there were a number of different biologic scaffolds. Some of them were xenografts, meaning that they came from non-human sources. For example, like pork bladder matrix was a very common uh, xenograft that we used in combination with PRP. Many people remember that as uh, the product called A-Cell, A-C-E-L-L. -L. And we used that back in the early 2000s in conjunction with PRP. Had a very prolonged effect in just using the PRP alone. Then we proceeded to use perinatal biologic tissues. And so these are placental derived tissues. These are healthy harvested placentals from, uh, placental tissues from screened, medically screened donors and then those are processed in clean rooms at FDA cleared laboratories and tissue banks and so forth. And then provided to physicians who do, for example, cornea surgery, uh, back surgery, orthopedic surgery, cosmetic procedures and treatments, you name it. And these placental tissues can be used as an adjunct for wound healing and for tissue regeneration repair. And that's been our mainstay of therapy. Uh, the PDO, polydioxinone, is a synthetic material. Many people are familiar with a long or slow absorbing suture material called polydioxinone. If they've had any kind of mesh repair like a hernia or they've had a, a big GI procedure, let's say a, a procedure in their abdomen, and the stitches needed to be there for a long time to create that repair. Polydioxinone is really the was the first Johnson & Johnson uh, product that was a very slow absorbing suture material that I remember back from the 1990s. And I think it was approved about 10 years prior to that. So today, polydioxinone is used in very, very small filaments for tissue regeneration in the skin. So for wrinkle reduction, it can also be used to pull and tug um, on areas that are sagging. It can be used for cellulite, for collagen stimulation, and so forth. And we learned about it at a cosmetic uh, conference in the Far East, someone said, hey, have you ever tried polydioxinone threads in the scalp for hair growth? I said, no. I said, I didn't hear about, I've never heard of that before. And so after chatting with some of my colleagues who had tried it and uh, doing some research in the clinical literature, we decided to give it a try. 
And lo and behold, the placement of these threads in the scalp, just the threads alone, stimulated a phenomenal amount, a surprising amount of hair regrowth in about the first six to 12 patients that we tried. And I was demonstrating the technique at a conference at the same time they wanted to do a PRP demonstration. So I ended up having a cancellation and we had to do the PRP and the PDO on the same patient. And let me tell you, that combination serendipitously triggered the most powerful hair regrowth I've ever seen up until that time from a regenerative procedure. And so we were super excited about adding PDO threads together with our PRP. And we've done so for a number of years. It's been about six or eight years now. And we've done thousands of these treatments. Um, the interesting thing is that we've never seen a complication. Sometimes the threads, you know, work their way out of the scalp. You just pull them by, mis- you know, if you just pull them out within a minute, they're gone. And then, uh, you know, they typically would just resolve on its own. But but those threads really stimulate a lot of hair regrowth. It's pretty amazing. And especially in conjunction with PRP or other treatments, you can really get a spectacular amount of regrowth. And so I found that that process really has uh, encouraged a longer uh, prolonged uh, effect from just our regular PRP alone and a much stronger effect from just our PRP alone. So PDO, polydioxinone threads, uh, we've taught a lot of surgeons how to do it now. A lot of physicians around North America are doing it, including those who I learned from in the Far East now. But um, it's a very exciting technology that is a very, very low risk, uh, low complication, very comfortable procedure to perform and has a great outcome. So I'm very excited about being able to provide that to our patients. And of course, we could always add exosomes to that uh, if you want. And there's uh, plenty of other new uh, technologies like hair follicle stem cell therapy also that's coming of age uh, that could be added as well to our PRP and regenerative treatments. Those those PDO threads, they dissolve on their own. Yeah. So they're placed in under the scalp at a very appropriate depth underneath the hair follicles. They dissolve over time. They do not create any excess inflammation. There's no, uh, you know, excess inflammation. Uh, If you were to biopsy it, you don't feel them, you don't see them. They just dissolve by themselves. Uh, And they last for about six to 12 months or so before you need to do it again. Wow. Fascinating. Awesome. Well, I know we're out of time. Uh, Fabulous stuff. This was great. And uh, such a holistic um, aspect of, of medicine therapy to incorporate things like nutraceuticals, just di- different kinds of uh, uh, supplementation, ashwagandha and, and, and probiotics and all that, and all the different procedures that you do, the microneedling, PRP and uh, TED and the PDO threads, all that. It's a very holistic approach. I mean, I think, you know, the hair follicle, just, you know, taking a step back, zooming out for a moment, what we see is the hair follicle is a very, very highly metabolic organ. So it can be affected by inflammation and nutrient status and fuel status. Of course, it can be affected by genetics. And we've talked about the effects of hormones on the hair follicle. It can be affected by blood circulation. So, you know, even adding things like nitric oxide into the regimen, nitric oxide boosters. I mean, all of these different things, as well as, like I said, taking a lifestyle approach because, you know, if you're dysregulated in your nutritional status, your sleep cycle, uh, whole body inflammation, your gut microbiome is out of whack. I mean, you're really going to have a hard time growing good hair. We see this again and again in our patients. And, you know, sometimes uh, my colleagues will present cases in, um, you know, our, our congresses and scientific meetings. And, you know, they're trying to figure out, well, what went wrong with this patient? And, you know, we ask these questions about lifestyle and nutritional status and medications that they're on. And, you know, and there's no answer. They don't, they don't have that information. They don't take that kind of medical history before we get start, they get started on the treatment or procedure. And it's, I think it's kind of sad. So being able to incorporate all of that and also to rectify those things, not just for the patient's hair, but for their longevity's sake, you know, and their health status and their just overall wellness and how they feel, man. I mean, it's, it's a really good feeling, not just to make them look good on the outside, but feel good on the inside too. Yeah. Awesome. So if our listener or or viewer wants to uh, get a a consult with you to uh, get the evaluation, they want to maybe partake in in, uh, one of your procedures, where do they go? How how do we uh, get them in touch with you? Yeah. So anybody out there, if you know, if you or a friend or family member is dealing or struggling with either a hair shedding problem or hair thinning problem, you're seeing more scalp shining through, more br- more hair in the brush or the drain. You need to get an evaluation by a full time board certified hair restoration physician, and you got to do your homework. 
but there's thousands of pages of information at baumanmedical.com, B-A-U-M-A-N medical.com. That's my website. I've written all of those pages myself personally over the past 25 years. And even if you just want to simply ask a question, you can go to baumanmedical.com slash ask and type in a question. Any question you have, I will respond. My team will respond. If you'd like to start a consultation process from a distance, like I said, from your home or phone, from anywhere in the world, baumanmedical.com, you can schedule a consultation. You can select schedule consultation. And then we can, with after a you know, few questions, we can get a, a handle on what's happening. Uh, but even if you just want to find out more information, baumanmedical.com is a place to be. And of course, we're located right here in South Florida. So not too far from Miami or Palm Beach. Uh, it's a sunny place, nice place to visit and to recoup from your hair transplant procedure or other treatments. And uh, I look forward to helping you. If you're struggling with hair loss, you don't have to. We have the ways to help you protect the hair that you have and also restore the hair that you've lost. And it would be my pleasure to do so. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Bauman. And thank you, listener. We'll catch you on the next episode. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, signing off.